The Lord be with you. Welcome to your Good Friday worship service as we remember and meditate on the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, all for our sakes. In today's service, we allow scripture to speak to us directly and help us understand the significance of Jesus' crucifixion at Calvary, especially in the midst of this uncertain and fearful time in the life of our nation and our world because of the pandemic. At the end of the service, Doug will offer a piano meditation, after which the service ends in silence and will continue on Easter Sunday morning. May God richly bless you and yours as you come near to the cross on this holy day that we call Good Friday. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, who redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Merciful God, you gave us your Son to suffer the shame of the cross. Save us from the hardness of heart and that seeing him who died for us, we may repent, confess our sins, and receive your overflowing love. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
The Old Testament reading today is from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and he was held up no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole again, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord was laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and the numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made the intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 22, a psalm of David. Hear the word of the Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, and you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who seek me mock at me, they make mouths at me, and they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord and let him deliver. Let him rescue 
the one who, in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe from my, on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help me. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls from Bashan surround me, and they open wide their mouths at me. Like a ravening and a roaring lion, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. My hands and feet are shriveled. I count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for your clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. I will tell your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of the offsprings of Jacob glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offsprings of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction or of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear me, fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All of the families of the nations shall worship him, worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth, da- earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down in th- to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
John's Gospel, we read this account of the passion of Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he has spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. 
The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the word. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went on again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. 
So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you born? Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, He brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing... They cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Madeleine. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. 
He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was the disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now that we've heard from John's Gospel, his account of Jesus' crucifixion, I just wish to concentrate on three simple words that Jesus said from the cross as recorded in verse 30 of chapter 19. It is finished. Now in order for us to properly understand what Jesus meant by it is finished, I believe we need to first recognize John's perception of Jesus' crucifixion. You see, in John's crucifixion account, Jesus is executed at the precise moment that worshippers sacrificed the Passover lambs in the temple. If you read the other gospel accounts of the same event, you might have noticed that there's a time difference of one day when compared to that of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's clear that for John, Jesus does not represent or even symbolize the Passover lamb because Jesus is the Passover lamb. As Passover represents liberation from Egyptian bondage, Jesus provides his followers freedom from sin and death. However, the problem is that when Jesus says, it is finished, most practically minded people like you and me may think it means he is finished. That is, Jesus is finished. Certainly these words don't inspire any confidence of faith that most of us need. Rather, they remind us of sayings like, he's a goner or she's history. In sports, young people often speak of a victory over an opponent with words like, we smoked them or we burned them. And so when Jesus says, it is finished, we may hear, I am finished. In his powerful book, Death on a Friday Afternoon, the late Richard John Newhouse writes, he started out announcing the coming of the kingdom of God, and he ends up here, some kingdom some king. The jeering crowds around the cross are having the last laugh. He talks so splendidly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What kingdom? What comfort? What inheritance? The time has come to face the fact. It is finished. It is over. While all that may be true to our perception, the Bible in general and John's Gospel in particular have a different understanding of what being finished is all about. It may be finished, but it's not over by any means of the imagination. This apparent end of Jesus is simply a new beginning for God because it is finished from John's point of view means, again in Newhouse words, it is settled, decided, certain, complete, and incontestable. 
While it's true that the cross may have suggested the end of Jesus' earthly life has come, what we forget from our worldly perspective is that Jesus' heavenly reign had just now begun. For John, it is finished simply means Jesus' work on earth is now complete or perfected. Now God can move on to the project of working through the apostles, the disciples, and the church to offer a message of redeeming love to all of humankind. Perhaps the most important thing we can say is, from God's point of view, the human project now can never fail because God has inserted himself into our world through Jesus and the work Jesus has finished or accomplished. When Jesus says, it is finished, he means the work for which God sent him to complete is finished. He could have just as easily said in our more contemporary expression, mission accomplished. However, our work is before us and not behind us. Even as Jesus' work is behind him. We are in mission for Christ. This is the work that Jesus has left for us to do. Sometimes when I hear the choir sing, it sounds better from where you sit than from up here. It's because when I'm too close, I hear too many individual voices. But when I step back and hear the blended voices in harmony, then I hear something beautiful. The church's ministry is just like that. We look better when we work as a faith community and not a gang of isolated individuals. Yes, today is Good Friday. And I'm asking you to pray silently for a moment and ask God to reveal to you the things that he wants you to accomplish by Easter sunrise. There may be a person in your life who needs your forgiveness. You may need to take the first step. Pray about that. There may be a deep and persistent grief gnawing at your soul, a sense of loss that you just cannot shake. Pray about that. Perhaps you have never forgiven yourself a secret sin that no one knows about. Pray to God about this and you know he will forgive you. But most of all, pray that God reveals to you some great work for you that is unfinished, especially during this uncertain and tumultuous time in our national life together. God has placed us where we are because he can use each of us to do his will. Pray for God's guidance that he may reveal your place of service in Jesus' name. And pray now to the one who sent Jesus Christ to give us all abundant life. And remember, no one and nothing is finished until Jesus says, it is finished. After a moment of sudden prayer, I will lead us in the prayers of the people. Now, dear people of God, God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. So let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ throughout the world, for his unity and witness and service, for all church leaders and ministers and the people whom they serve, for all the people of this presbytery, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm the church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace.
eternal God, by your spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry, we may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for the President of the United States and the Congress and Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. And also let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted with in body or in mind especially during this pandemic, which has affected so many. For the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of God's love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ, and persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who don't know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Eternal God of unchanging power and light, look with mercy on your whole church. Bring to completion your saving work so that the whole world may see the fallen lifted up, the old made new, and all things brought to perfection by him through whom all things were made, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And now let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have asked and taught us to say, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm.